Adett projekt célja, hogy felhívja a figyelmet a gyermekek környezetének, az iskola környezeteknek a fontosságára. És ez a tíznapos workshop egy nagyon fontos állomás, a mérföld köve volt a Ladett projektnek, hiszen itt a nemzetközi hallgatók az elméleti tudás után megismerkedtek a részvételi tervezés gyakorlatával is. Az iskola közösséggel közösen alakítottuk és gondolkodtunk együtt a környezetről. We aim is to empower communities, either in a specific team or either uh, for their own needs. And right now we are here in Miskolc and we're trying to first to understand what are their needs, what are the landscape challenges, and uh, what kind of interventions, either short term or maybe in the long term, we could do to, uh, to get to a better situation. Ami nagyon nagy probléma a városban, az a hátrányos helyzetű gyerekek és családoknak a, azért szerintem az országos átlagnál nagyobb arányú jelenléte. Tehát Miskolcon 11-ben azonosított szegregátum van, hasonló, tehát nagyon sok problémát hordoz, nagyon sok összetett és komplex problémát hordoz. A gyerekek azok mindig, mindig központi szereplője az ilyen programoknak, mert, mert ahhoz, hogy megtörjön ez az új rökített szegénység, ahhoz mindenképp arra van szükség, hogy ők ki tudjanak törni belőle, és ott a képzésnek és az oktatásnak nagy jelentősége van. És az ambétkenek egészen különleges és hatékony módszerei vannak az ilyen körülmények közül jövő gyerekekkel való foglalkozásnak. Dr. Ambertkár iskolában vagyunk Miskolcon, ami iskola kifejezetten olyan fiatalok számára jött létre, akik fiatalok nem jutnak be normális körülmények között a középfokú oktatásba. A gyerekeink döntő többsége nagyon szegény környezetekből jönnek, elszegregálódó település részekről, ahol nincsen nagyon kifutása az életnek, nincsen hogy megszületni, a cigányobodába járni, cigányiskolába járni és közmunkán maradni. Így nőnek föl generációk, és az iskolánk egyik fő missziója az az mégiscsak, hogy a világot abban valójában próbáljuk meg megmutatni, ami mások számára elérhető. És azzal, hogy itt a világ különböző tájáról érkeztek emberek, és időt töltöttek a mi gyerekeinkkel, hát ez az egyik legnagyobb hozzáadott értéke ennek a programnak. A gyerekek roppant gyorsan és sokat képesek tanulni, viszont nagyon fontos, hogy milyen módon szólunk hozzájuk. A Ladder projektben kiemelten fontos volt számunkra, hogy interaktív játékos eszközökkel közelítsük meg a témát. A Miskolci Dr. Ámbétkár iskola diákjaival pedig kifejezetten fontosnak tartottuk, hogy aktívan, cselekvően közelítsék meg a környezetükkel való kapcsolatukat, és ezért az úgynevezett learning by doing módszert alkalmaztunk, vagyis cselekedve tanultunk. Tehát az iskola környezet alakításán keresztül tapasztalhatták meg a diákok, hogy milyen hatással van a környezet rájuk, illetve ők milyen hatással tudnak lenni a környezetükre. Építész hallgatókkal egyből azon kezdtünk el. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Um, we're all very welcome to this, the first lecture in the 2022 uh, season of landscape where the disciplines meet. Um, it's really nice to see so many people. Um, I'm not going to announce the Um, the program item by item, but just to let you know that we have a program which runs through to the end of the year with the usual break in the summer. This is the second year of the series. You'll recall that last year, of course, we were forced on, online, so many of us who are working in various institutions. Um, and so this was, I suppose, a way of availing of the, of the new reality of online work and uh, to use the power of, of online media uh, to the advantage of our members um, and so tonight are, are well for some of you it's tonight for some of us it's still the um, 
the afternoon. So Dr. Ellen Fetzer, um, in collaboration with Denny Ruggieri, is going to give us our first paper. Um, and then we have a respondent as well, who I'll, I will introduce uh, at the end of Ellen's paper. Uh, the title of the paper is Community Scales Toward a Socially Transformative Pedagogy in Design and Planning, a Critical Reflection. Ellen is very well placed uh, to give us a critical reflection. She is the lead to leap project coordinator. She holds a diploma and a doctoral degree in landscape planning from Kassel University in Germany. And she coordinates the international masters in landscape architecture at uh, Nürtingen Gieslingen University. Um, among her work, she focuses on computer supported collaborative learning, transnational education, all of the things that we I've been talking about just a few moments ago, and she collaborates with colleagues from uh, the field of business on social innovation, landscape economy, and entrepreneurship. Uh, she's currently the president of ECLAS, the European Council of Landscape Architecture Schools, and our respondent is also from that organization. So Ellen, um, the floor is yours. I would ask everybody to make sure that your mics are turned off. You can make uh, uh, comments and questions as you go along in the chat, and we will revert uh, to those questions during the questions and answers as well. So as a thought or a comment arises, uh, feel free to put it into the chat. Um, and then when it comes to the questions and answers, we can uh, work through either the questions or we'll ask you to switch on your mic. So Ellen, it's a pleasure to have you. We're really looking forward uh, to your paper and the floor is yours. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, Connor, and also welcome to everyone here. And it's great to be here in a Uniscape audience. And as I was looking through the um, people who came here, it's quite nice because some people I've met, of course, on different occasions. Uh, it's kind of the landscape scene, and some people are even new from the social innovation scene. So it's quite nice how everything comes together here because indeed it's all inter in interconnected. So today from our side, yeah, a view on what we call landscape democracy. Um, yeah, that was maybe our inspiration coming from the landscape convention um, as landscape architects. Um, so how might we really um, in, in incorporate what the convention wants from us in our design education. And this has been a quite long journey and it's maybe a good moment at the, uh, now to reflect a little bit how far we have got in this field, which is really, um, yeah, when you open one door, uh, there's like, like 10 doors behind to be discovered. It's a quite complex issue. Because, um, yeah, indeed, uh, when we look at the European Landscape Convention, it's not the Landscape Architecture con uh, Convention, which landscape architects are sometimes a bit con uh, con uh, confused about, because they don't own <laughs> they don't own the landscape, um, as they sometimes assume, because there's indeed, I think there are some provocative messages in the convention um, to, yeah, to, to landscape architecture and also the design and planning uh, disciplines that are, of course, also shaping our in environments. And I think the two are really important, of course, um, what we all know, the definition to say that landscape is an area as perceived by people. So it's not an area as perceived by experts or as perceived by planners and designers or landscape architects. It's by the people um, who live in it. They shape their understanding, their values by their daily experience, by their past, by their interconnections. Uh, so that's one thing. And of course, the other important point is that um, yeah, the um, convention wants us to really establish procedures for the participation of the general pub uh, public in all these processes, especially in the setting of democratic, legitimated landscape quality of um, objectives. And that's again a provocation to planners and designers who are trained um, to be the ones who are setting the objectives because they, of course, know about all the science behind what is what is what are the values of nature and biodiversity and whatever we might have in in space. Um, so here again, it's something we need. To, yeah, which is hard to digest actually for planners and the designers. And we were actually confronted with the question: uh, So how are actually, how are we going to do? This. So how might we prepare our students? And we eventually found out it's not so much about the students, it's more about ourselves. <laughs> how do we actually also prepare ourselves as educators um, to be prepared for this challenge, to really, in, to really incorporate it seriously in our education? And we talk here about educational programs in higher education. 
So education of landscape architects, urban planners are, are architects. Um, so this is the scope of, let's say, learning that we looked at here. Of course, there's more in, in, in environments where you can have landscape pedagogy, but here it's especially about the training of experts in planning and design. So um, yeah, this has been our journey, maybe a little bit, uh, maybe some of us, um, uh, some, some of you already know us for a while because we started this already in 2015. It's um, it's all about Erasmus Plus uh, co um, collaboration uh, projects um, in the past they were called um, strategic partnerships. So it's actually a grant that gives universities a chance to cooperate in a very focused way on, an, um, let's say, an educational innovation or a curriculum innovation they would like to um, they would like to embrace. So we, we, we together wanted to look into this: how to include landscape democracy in education. Our first round resulted in establishing a transnational online course. Um, so we have been doing online education already long before the COVID pandemic came. <laughs> and we still believe it's, it's, a, it's a great way of making universities um, work together and benefit from each other. We uh, had a power application, as you can see from uh, the University of Bologna, who is a partner here. There's an INBO um, special issue about landscape education for democracy. We had three workshops in Zingonia, Italy, in Kassel, Germany, and to to, to Rick Ballant in Hungary. So that was the first um, adventure which uh, helped us to set the ground in education. And then we followed up with a second uh, project cycle, which is still running, where we said the LED, the landscape education for democracy, should actually leap. <laughs> so leap for, uh, for, forward. And leap stands for learning, empowerment, agency, and partnerships. So the um, addition we, um, yeah, we, are, we are trying or developing right now, uh, we are still keeping our transnational on, on, online seminar for the students. But we have now reached out to um, the local sites, to the local community much more intensively and, and we do this by um, establishing four local living labs as, um, as we call them and they are now uh, the, uh, developing at different university locations as really an, an environment where we should really partner with a local community and help bring out the university out of the ivory tower <laughs> the, um, di directly into touch um, with the direct environment. And we had three workshops. Um, some of them are still happening this year, in, in, uh, again in Italy, Germany, and hung Hungary. And you see here the logo of our current project. And at the moment, we are looking into uh, the future. So um, we're actually in the process of um, preparing uh, another follow-up where we think now it's really about disseminating what uh, we know, uh, maybe really pack it into really useful learning materials in diff different languages, um, to really explore a little bit more the open ed education and really make sure that the living labs are continuing are, continu are continuing. So this is maybe the, um, uh, the, the, the package to follow up after 2022 and we are getting ready at the moment to prepare for that. So this is a little bit the, the story of our project so far. So it has been like um, yeah seven years <laughs> dealing with landscape democracy and um, I have learned a lot, but I would not say that I am at the end of the story nor that all it's getting <laughs> quite exciting. And of course, there's always people behind. So I'm talking here from my perspective, but um, there's, uh, you see here the partners ranging from Norway, uh, Hungary, Italy, and now we have uh, Sweden in, uh, involved in the new project. And some people are, are staying on and some are new, some are PhD students. So we have people actually also following up with, with PhD um, in this environment. So it's actually a, a quite nice network of people who are cross-fertilizing each other. Um, so here you see a few faces, maybe, you know, a few of them. I, I won't go through all people but um it's all really valuable um but maybe uh going a little bit beyond um the project itself um to talk about what is the bigger picture behind um uh, maybe some of you have uh, followed up uh, what the European Union has recently come up with. They have actually published a new competence framework um, about sustainability. Actually, they call it the Green Competence Framework. And this is a really interesting de uh, development, I think. Of course, there has been a lot of research by um, educators about yeah, which uh, competences do we actually need to embrace when we want to be competent for sustainable development and transformation for sustainability. And um, so a lot has been published on this. And I think the synthesis the European Union has now come up with is really very interesting. And the visualization they've made is even um, more inspiring, I think. Um, so you see here what is actually what, what I think education needs to embrace. And it has a lot to do with landscape because I think what we see on the picture here is something 
that really comes down and becomes concrete and becomes visible for communities in our landscapes. So this is maybe the link between sustainable development and the European Landscape Convention somehow. So this is maybe the competence framework that we need. Um, you, you see here very active bees. So this is you and me and everyone who wants to <laughs> promote sustainability. We have to be able to frame problems um, and it's, it's in the landscape where these system relationships become apparent, where we can um, really apply system thinking to understand what are root causes and what are really actors that are um, involved um, in this uh, system context and also be, of course, critical with the reality we see. Of course, we are dealing with our everyday environments, but we need to be critical and really see what might be the alternative to what we see and how might we behave differently, how might we um, yeah, use our space better and more inclusively, because we might have also future literacy, so we might be able to forecast um, what are the consequences of what we are doing if we continue as, as we do, you know, to which future are, are we going to arrive, so we can also trace back what do we need to change today in order to um, ha have a better future. And of course, for this, we need collective action. So we need to activate others, but we also need in, in the in individual e initiatives. So to really be also a role model for change. And it's not just in our um, own network, of course, pol political agencies also mentioned here. Um, so it's really about shaping the discourses, which then of course might lead to changes in the resources and in the Actor constellations. So, this um, what, what looks like a very nice um, uh, children's drawing here <laughs> is a very powerful concept of how we need to change our education. And um, I really recommend everyone to look at this publication. It has a lot of inspiration. And um, I think um, in this network of landscape and educators, there's so much room for really translating this into what we want to do when we really want to have a sustainable change in uh, the landscape. So, this is the one big picture really, education for sustainable development. It, is a, is a global thing. It's not just, just, just the European Union. We have worldwide, um, through the United Nations, actually a movement um, that promotes education for sustainable development. It's not just in Europe. So it's the one thing. And the other thing, of course, uh, we are all un universities here and um, you're all, of course, involved in science. You have your agendas, your research agendas and so on. But here again, um, what, what calls here is a new role of science, which we call transformative science. So when we really step into this idea of um, education for sustainable development, uh, trying to think alternatives for our landscapes with the communities in a participatory way, then it's not just I, I research you and I know what is the research question. It's No, it's really I go um, into your community environment and I want to understand with you what is the issue here, what are your values, what, um, what are your goals for this environment and can we together change it and explore this as our research topic, the change process itself. So this is called participatory action research and it's getting more and more, um, I think, talk, talked about, but it's maybe exactly the research framework and the research approach that we need here. And I, from what I, I observe, it's, I think many um, disciplines still have a hard time moving into this direction of um, seeing research uh, as, 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 some, as something which is maybe also non subjective, um, it is non-objective, non, non but really subjective and involves actually uh, being engaged and in partnership with people who are not scientists. So this is something which is still a provocation, I think, from, from many disciplines. But when we really want to move ahead here with the convention, this is something I think which might be a bit uncomfortable for, for, for some um, uh, departments. But I think um, we need to change our mindset here and move ahead also with accepting action research, participatory action research as a valid uh, research agenda. Um, yeah, and then, of course, again, the university itself, uh, so very, very often perceived as the ivory tower, <laughs> where, of course, everything is objective and controlled, and there's, of course, gates, and if you are not um, if you don't have a certain degree, you will never end, end and so on. For many people who live in the in the, the landscapes we care about, this is an unreachable environment. And um, the European Union is very keen on on, cha on changing this. So they have expressed this actually in the renewed higher education agenda already already a few years ago. But I think we are still far away from really doing it because if we really want to jump out of the ivory tower, it means eye-to-eye -eye engagement with the communities that are around us, which is, of course, an additional 
effort. We sometimes call it the third mission of your universities um, next to uh, education and research, like the third pillar of um, what universities should do. And it's a great potential for, again, for the landscape con convention, because what is out there <laughs> out of the universities, you have a very interesting landscape with all its conflicts and its, its uh, potentials, its sustainability challenges and its people. So now the, now the question is, how do you as a university actor would move out and build your own lab environment where you really try to explore in a transformative manner what are the issues, how can we change them? So we need, but, and I've written down here what is actually needed on behalf of the educators. You have to be co committed to these people at eye level. You have you need to empathize with them and to be the partner. And so for this, you need, of course, a certain methodology, um, a good communication. You need to manage what you have learned to give it to the next batch of people or group, uh, group of students. And of course, you have to design and change your curricula in a way that you can incorporate uh, these processes, which is sometimes the, the hardest thing to do in some universities because they are so strict. Um, that's, that's one thing. Uh, and of course, what we need to do is that we need to con connect, to understand, to vision with them, prototype things, what might be the alternatives, and to coordinate maybe ideas. To, to make sure they, that they might really have some impact. So um, it's a big package when we really want to be transformative and do what um, these agendas uh, tell, tell, tell us to do. And they really ask here for a new idea of what an academic should be doing. And yeah, and I can say it's, it's uh, consuming a lot, lot, lot of my time, <laughs> but I also say I really get a lot out, out of it because uh, it helps me to test uh, what I actually think and and value as, as a landscape architect. So it's really, it's constantly, you're constantly reflecting your own val values and this way they also develop or they co-evolve with the communities. And I find this really valuable. Well, um, so this is now what we are doing here um, uh, as a team, as a landscape democracy uh, team, dem dem democracy team. So we uh, say, of course, that these type of issues of uh, challenges are somehow apparent in every neighborhood. And every university uh, is actually part partnering with one landscape in their direct environment and uh, and uh, the people who live there. Because everywhere we find social and environmental issues, uh, we need open and democratic decision making and to cultivate it. And we have some landscape planning and design issues that might help to transform something to a better solution. So these things, yeah, you encounter them everywhere. We all know that it's important, but we hardly know how to do it and how it feels like. So the idea of our curriculum is um, that staff and students get go through this experience so they have deeper awareness of what it means. They have gone through it, they have practiced it uh, at once. They are, they, are, they are not perfect participatory planners when they have gone through it once, but it's, it's an opening of a pathway they might choose in their professional career and then deepen as uh, they go. So for us, it's important that every student has at least made um, a contact with this approach uh, during uh, the studies. And some of them say, oh, I'm not a participatory designer. I will never do it. <laughs> and some say, oh, this might be really for me. And then when you discover them again a few years later, they might have really uh, made some steps ahead in their offices or wherever they uh, work. So it's about raising awareness and getting a first touch about how it might be. And this is a bit just very practical how it works out in practice. We run this always in the summer. And, and, and it starts again actually in the end of March. We have these five phases. So, and uh, this is uh, when you see it, the numbers you see uh, when um, these are really the meetings when we get together across these different con countries in sessions like this on Zoom, where we exchange our theories, methods, approaches, and we hear from the different labs how they have actually, uh, what, what, what was their, their experience on site. So, we also learn across places. And uh, then the students are going through these assignments and they all um, apply this in their local labs, in their local environments with their local communities. So they do a conceptual map of what the community is about. They try to involve the community in the ev evaluation and assessment of the issues at stake. They try to, um, yeah, they uh, to test how collaborative visioning works with the community members. And then they go into a co-design and transformation process where they come up with a prototype of change that is really also placed into the landscape. And, if, uh, and this would be, a, um, be, would be the basis to evaluate also with the communities how they would actually see this change. 
So this is all uh, what you can pack into one semester needs to work also, of course, for the students. And of course, we have uh, always uh, a responsibility uh, here as educators that we try to compromise the needs of the communities and their process of the needs of uh, the students. Because as we evolve year by year, the topics in the communities are evolving as well. And this is also a new role as an educator that you are orchestrating this kind of process, which is, of course, generating a lot of communication and information and so on. But this is, yeah, when you want to make, make it really real, <laughs> that's the consequence. Yeah, um, so this is um, another so we have this online course, which you've seen here. Then we have these intensive projects. And here, Erasmus helps us a lot to get students really from one place to another to really embrace a landscape that they, that they don't know. And you see here just impressions from Kassel, Italy, and Hungary from um, the last workshops we had. Of course, COVID was a bit hard for us because we couldn't meet on site. And uh, like everyone, we tried to cope with it. And, and we did online engagement things. Um, Yes, but that was really a challenge, as you might, might imagine. And um, and this is a little bit impressions what happens really in the living labs. So from our um, current project, and you see here that we also try to involve um, a com community uh, through Zoom sessions and to um, yeah to actually to uh, translate the processes that we would have done actually in on-site workshops also in a virtual setting. It was a bit challenging, but it's also of course a way. Uh, which might be also important for the future because depending on how you design these participatory processes, it can be important to have a digital component because you might be able to include people who wouldn't maybe participate in an on-site meeting for various issues because they might not have time. So that's again something we want the students to become aware of that they need always multiple approaches if they want to um, in, if they want to involve a diversity of community members. So you see also here the, pro the prototypes and here you see that people have invented, invented games, for example, to make people more aware of uh, their river or there was a participatory bench where you, can, where you could add an evaluation and here an exhibition where um, uh, the community could actually come. And this was all also COVID adapted. So things that were really outside uh, to avoid that people would gather too much inside. So that was all, I think, very much shaping what we were doing last year. Yeah, and just maybe if to sum up a little bit what we learned from these living labs so far, um, maybe some key characteristics and learnings uh, that are also reflected by other readings and researches here, uh, because uh, the living labs is something which is, I think, going on a lot at uh, the moment in really different places and uh, different disciplines. So I think what we have learned is that um, there is deep reflection about the world of science, of course, especially when we talk about this with other colleagues who simply do different type of research who might be um, having their labs, their real labs controlled experiments and these kind of things so that so sometimes don't understand what we are doing. But uh, what we say the world of science is here we need to uh, have this co-creation uh, approach. So you involve um, yourself as a scientist or an organizer with the community uh, to have an equal um, uh, process of creating values, knowledge and information about and, and, and even about the research questions itself. They might be co-created also with the community. So this is, of course, a new approach that many people might not be so familiar with. Now, of course, and this requires that you develop a culture of collaboration, and um, which is the same as maybe cultivating democracy. And uh, this is, of course, a change of thinking that also the ELC wants us, or maybe provokes us, no? because uh, we are used to, oh, we don't want to engage so much with it, we just go to our votes every five years, and that's it with the democracy. <laughs> but this is not what I think the ELC is actually wanting. And again, it, it comes back here if we want to have it. It's like in a garden, you need to go every day and water the flowers and make sure that there is equal balance of what you want and what might not be so much wanted and so on and to deliberate and so on. So it's really about cultivating this. Um, and again, this is a new role for universities to tap into this. It's additional resources we need and we try to find them all the time. <laughs> Yeah, and then, of course, on that basis, really identify and address local needs to make what you do really relevant for whoever you are able to connect with. It might be something which is competing with the official democratic processes, which might be done by the elected town council and the officials from the planning authorities. Of course, there's all sorts of people who claim to have authority and, of course, um, 
of course, when we talk about representative democracy, it's of course important to respect it. But at the same time, landscape issues are sometimes so complex that it's um, it's uh, it's too much for public authorities to really engage with that. So, and I think we need really I think we really need the policy shift here that uh, public authorities learn to be able to accept that there might be alternative processes that they should actually more try to empower maybe local um, local co-creation. Um, uh, and may, of course, it implies that they give away power. And this, I think this is a struggle very subtle at the moment, which we um, have to go through, I think, if we really want to make the convention happen. <laughs> and um, not everyone believes in that. And um, but well, it's a process. Yeah, but I think only if we really uh, have this link to the people and their needs and a certain deliberation and understanding, then it's really impactful. And if it's impactful, it will be empower itself and, and become sustainable on uh, that, uh, uh, that basis. This is something which you don't know in advance. You have to cultivate again and see who's there and see who uh, whom you can empower. Yeah. Um, of course, this needs time and resources, and this is maybe also the reason why some things cannot be uh, not uh, sustained, because maybe the universities don't find a way to, yeah, to put these uh, resources of time. It's uh, it, it uh, depends very much on the character and the commitment of people, like uh, like always. Um, but the question is, if universities, if they really take the third mission seriously in the future. Uh, are trying to invest more in uh, to this. I think there is a transformation going on, but it's not yet. It's it's small seeds, but I see here still a need in the, the future. Yeah, and of course, and you have to be adaptable because maybe the community and the local landscape you discover doesn't bring with it what you have um, initially anticipated. <laughs> Especially as a landscape architect, you always think, oh, we have to organize the traffic and we have to make more green here and more water um, place there. Because you go <laughs> you, you go into these places with your own concepts, but then you start engaging with people and you realize actually they need something, something different. And then you need to be flexible to be able to adapt really to the needs and uh, respond to that because on that basis you will build community and then maybe all the other things that you have maybe um, originally thought of will come maybe later. So this flexibility to really trust in the process is also something many people need, need to learn, I think. And, um, and uh, talking about learning, um, this is also important that yeah, you have processes of learning and reflection that everyone involved um, is involved. So not just you as teacher and the students, also the community members, because they might also have values that they want to share and which are important to understand to really have an understanding of how valuable the process was. So this is all <laughs> what, what, what we've learned so far. As you, you can see, it's a long journey. And I cannot say that I'm actually, even if we have been on it now for five years, I, I say I'm just at the beginning of understanding what is to really impact on this, on education and how we understand our self-understanding of universities. Um, there's um, a lot, I think, <laughs> to work on. And uh, But but uh, uh, the good thing is, and I saw that Dan is here, for example, because he has been working with us for quite a few years in a similar concept on social innovation. And you see here more or less all the projects that um, ECLAS and Lenotta and our partners have actually somehow um, built on uh, with the same context. So we have one on water areas, we have uh, the learning landscapes. Now, we recently started in as for food, which is, which is about food um, networks. Uh, social innovation has been running also since 2015. And Telos just started, which is about landscape economy. So it's always the same principles, so an online class for the theories, and then really getting grounded and trying to link to local communities. And this way, it's somehow, as I said already to Connor, it's mushrooming. <laughs> and I can really recommend you to use the Erasmus Plus program to cooperation projects. Um, for getting these type of things done because this is what they are for. Yeah, and uh, just an outlook where we think we could, this is one way of what we think could be the future of what we're doing because you see there's really quite a few partners in, but it's very you you uh, you centric. But actually, um, I mean, we are dealing with global questions here about democracy, local democracy, uh, governance, um, sustainability, and the world of the landscape. And I think it's a global topic. So what we would really like to maybe explore if um, our experience can be open 
and um, and if the community can grow to a global community, which is uh, uh, yeah, which is somehow sharing the same approaches, not in the sense that we as Europeans know how it works and tell the others no, it's really about having an open place where we could all meet. Um, and I would be really excited to learn, for example, from someone from a different continent, a very different socioeconomic environment, how they actually deal with communities, how they do local empowerment and governance design and so on for the landscape. So that would be my personal goal, just to see how we can advance here. And I'm happy that Arati is with us, for example, who comes from a different um, um, continent. And of course, she can already bring new perspectives here. And um, yeah, that's um, basically what I wanted to share so far. And um, I have no idea about the, the about the time, <laughs> but for me, um, that's basically my slides. <laughs> and we can actually then see if we want to. I, I don't know what was the plan to discuss now, or to give the floor to the respondent first. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank mm -hmm. you very much, Alan, for that. Mm -hmm. um, that was great. It was full of energy and passion, and you've shared so generously all your personal insights and the ones you've gained. In the work that you've done and the effort is really um is really admirable i have to say i've been looking forward to this lecture for a long time because i have <laughs> I've actually felt that you know one of the things that unescape should be doing is is uh, sharing more experiences as teachers because um you know we all know how to research we collaborate in different ways with different people we have different angles and so on but the teaching is something that that i think we should really um, share more experiences and certainly you've done that for us and started what I think will be a very interesting conversation I'd love to see that um, that move along and go forward um, but at this stage anyway I'd like to open the, the, the floor up to questions and for that to happen I want to pass over uh, to the director of Unescape to Tessa uh, who's going to introduce uh, our respondent so thank you for that so far Thank you, Connor. And uh, before introducing our respondent, uh, Arati Utur, please uh, let me thank uh, Ellen too for her exhaustive, inspiring, and promising uh, presentation, full of energy, as Connor <laughs> said. We are particularly glad to have her here tonight to start our uh, Where Discipline Meet series, um, just to trigger uh, with uh, a lot of. Uh, uh, communicating um, skills, uh, this uh, series of uh, conferences. Um, and thank you also for having opened so many perspectives uh, in the field of education and uh, research. Uh, so we, we come back to our respondent, Arati Uttur. Um, she is uh, the coordinator, she has a, a, an important role. She is the coordinator for social media and communications for the ecosystem of ECLAS, so the European Council of Landscape Architecture School, Le Notre Institute, and also for the Journal of Landscape Architecture. Um, Arati um, has uh, recently completed the master program at the International Master in Landscape Architecture, um, and uh, she, during this uh, study, studies time, she has tutored uh, uh, different international seminars within the IMLA um, master. Uh, for example, uh, community learning for local change, Erasmus plus landscape education for democracy and the language, uh, also language, culture, and landscape seminar. Um, she has a background uh, um, of design for educational spaces uh, in uh, her previous architectural uh, profession. And now she, uh, I like very much the, this uh, expression, she inculcates uh, sustainable thinking in young minds. <laughs> So we are uh, very much looking forward to um, hear Arati's uh, contribution. So um, Arati, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Tessa and uh, Connor, and for Uniscape for having me here. Um, and it's an honor actually to be able to speak um, with Ellen for um, this important topic that is uh, landscape education for democracy. Um, 
Uh, just a couple of uh, reflections on what Ellen already said regarding um, the Let to Leap program um, and the way it actually takes up the provocative questions that are coming from uh, the European Commission. And this is something really unique uh, that they have uh, you know, decided to do and to do something about actually. And this gives, this opens the floor for a lot of um, active dialogue that can happen in the landscape. And I had the, the good opportunity to be a part of um, quite a few of these uh, programs and they're very exciting interdisciplinary, international um, conversations that come up between the universities and not then just the universities, uh, they get translated into different landscapes um, from different places. And that's a very big uh, um, advantage to have, especially as a student. And I wouldn't say only from landscape architecture, this is um, best, and the most effective when it happens on an inter interdisciplinary front. And the more we collaborate with people from different backgrounds, the better outcomes we have, the better conversations we have. It opens up our perspectives and this becomes then um, what it's actually supposed to be on, on a practical level. Uh, so let me just uh, share my screen to Just continue a little bit on what um, Ellen is talking about. Um, so what happens with um, landscape democracy in a real time scenario? Um, I was a part of this, um, the IP in Hungary that we did last year in the end of uh, August. And as you saw in the video that was at the beginning of this uh, session, um, it was a kind of a sneak peek into what happened over there through the ladder project. And this was again, an extremely unique experience because the community belongs um, to the Roma group of people who you know, feel um, and are extremely sidelined from um, mainstream society, so to say, if I may say it like that. And the kind of challenges they face um, cannot be visualized uh, only through conversations that you and I might be having here or even when we, we meet in person. What comes up when you meet these people and get to live with them for a few days is, uh, you know, it's a totally different world somehow. And um, like Ellen always says, landscape is everything that surrounds us. Um, so the kind of input that comes in from these kind of conversations, um, it opens up the mindset of not just students who are taking part, but also the community that we are interacting with because they come with a certain background, they come with a certain set of perspectives that they already have. And when they start conversing with us, it's, uh, it's an exchange of information, of knowledge, of ideas. And it's very revealing for both sides actually. Um, and what happens, like I said, in an interdisciplinary group is this very uh, unique exchange of ideas where people put in everything that they, from the side that they are coming from. So in this picture, for example, you can see a person from Thailand, from India, from Bangladesh, um, and from um, Mishkols, which is a small city in the northeast of Hungary. And this kind of exchange, not just from a cultural interdisciplinary background, but then also the kind of um, professional uh, backgrounds that they come with. And these students are then um, taking part in a landscape, um, a master in landscape education. And that becomes then uh, this really unique kind of uh, mix of what can happen in a landscape. And that's why, like Ellen says, landscape is everything that surrounds us. It's not just plants and greenery and green infrastructure. And of course, all of those are important, but taking into picture everything that can play a role in the landscape um, is very important for something that can be implemented then. And just to give you a little more insight into what it looks like when we have these intensive programs on site, 
after having an online session that is very intense as well. We collaborate with different partner universities, uh, like Ellen mentioned, and we group um, people and students together from different universities to work together. Um, and then these groups uh, get the opportunity to meet in person um, on a chosen landscape issue and site. And we try to solve this, not just among us in an, in an academical manner, but in a very, very interactive way by having conversations with the people who are in this landscape. And this kind of interaction then comes out, um, brings out these kind of outcomes that are really necessary in that space and responsive to that. Um, so what Ellen was talking about, um, about listening to people and really kind of giving a response of what is needed there and not just coming from your own um, approach of what can be a good landscape solution um, is more important than, you know, just having something on a design board that looks good. And what kind of impact um, something like a really small intervention like you can see here can have, uh, can only be experienced in person. So this school, um, if you see the image on the left, uh, it has a building that was donated to it. It comes from a really poor background, um, like the director of the school mentioned in the video. And the name that you see on the building is also a name um, that is not of the school. It belonged to somebody before and they don't even have the money to, to paint the building, for example. And the simple act of greening up the facade and putting herbs uh, in windows um, gave the school an identity uh, that we cannot perceive what kind of difference it made um, to them and the kind of confidence it gave them and the kind of recognition it gave them then eventually. Um, within one day of having installed these plants, um, people on the street were wondering what this building was about. Um, nobody knew that there's, there's a school existing inside and people go to school here at this building that looks so dilapidated. And um, following which, um, after two months, when um, Anita went back to, to talk to the school and see how they were progressing, um, what you see on the left is um, what we had left behind is uh, then blooming uh, very well and uh, that some kind of appreciation is happening in the space and that they are really uh, using what we left behind. But what you see on the right is a really um, acknowledgeable impact that these acts had within this 10 day IP that we had in sight that the Roma community got then an opportunity in the municipality to voice their concerns. And the municipality was now going to start accommodating a section in their department for addressing Roma issues. And this is, this is a really, really um, meaningful change for this community and the kind of confidence it gave them um, was kind of um, inexplicable. So, um, yeah, this was just like a kind of um, a revelation to show what, um, you know, acts of landscape democracy can do when we come together from these different backgrounds and we actually work towards change that is needed and change that can move forward. So, yeah, that, um, can then open up a space and time for people to share their thoughts with us. And it would be very nice then for people to be able to exchange some questions. Thank you. Thank you, Arati, uh, um, for this, uh, uh, for your remarks, uh, for uh, uh, your suggestion, and also for having um, brought as uh, into this process and for having shown how does it uh, work. And now I think we can open the, the floor for the discussion. I don't know if uh, anybody has a question. Perhaps if I could get the ball rolling with just a question that can be answered by both of you. Um, your experience of working with communities, um, engaging with communities, I mean, clearly from what you've shown us, both of you have shown us in particular, Arati, at the end there, how valuable 
this is and how even very small steps can lead to very big changes. The butterfly beats its wings and something magical happens. Um, from your experience, um, is there a model um, in place to, to, uh, to, prepare, um, to prepare both the academics and students and the community to actually begin to engage or um, how do you set that in motion? Are there some communities who, because of, if you like, their social and uh, we say political community uh, um, practices and infrastructure are already open and ready to engage in this type of conversation uh, and other ones who have a longer journey to travel to get to that point and if so what might be the difference mm -hmm. hope i hope i've made them I, I hope that question makes sense maybe i can continue this but i think um there's two types that we have encountered so what is of course easy if you have a community of interest so there might be already people who are involved in interested in urban gardening people who are interested in maybe social integration or who want to do fair trade or Mm. energy resource efficient housing I, I don't know I mean these uh, people are always there and then it's of course easy for university uh, because you have already a kind of a scope around which you want to work and you can just uh, expand on that but very often in our landscapes um, it's not clear who is the community and this is I think in particular the challenge when we talk about landscape democracy and what the European landscape convention or what is maybe the hidden put, uh, the hidden power of the European landscape convention because it might be a tool to bring uh, to build community and this is i think a different uh, here you need of course very different approaches what we are exploring for example what, what we are going to explore this spring is the role of games um so uh, so to really invent um games that are uh, somehow adapted to a specific landscape context it can be a neighborhood or a specific type type of landscape and uh, through uh, through this game um that we build a community or bring them in touch especially now in, in the, the post covid experience where people are have been going through so much isolation and is hesitating to be part of any community activities i think we need now really innovative approaches to get the community visible <laughs> i think so this is i think kind of the challenges we are facing right now because people are so um, they're so turned down i think in that sense at the moment i think this is all maybe everywhere um so so you need innovative approaches to make people think or get connected to this idea of that they have a shared landscape because we are even i think we are that down actually that many people are um, not actually reachable uh, even if they are part of global landscape because they might not be interested in it, they might not have the communication channels they might not feel, feel part of what seems to be the community there's many there's many different com communities in the same landscape and uh, so on and so forth so you need to be i think you all need to be really creative and innovative um to let's say to raise awareness or to build community with this idea of landscape of going beyond my own interest this is really hard <laughs> but maybe that's uh, that's the key yeah I, i'm interested in, in, in actually what you said there about the COVID because um as soon as you said it i realized in fact that is a mechanism um of of the realization of what landscape and quality of landscape offered uh, even if it's a even if it's a message that came about because of absence so when people were um, so denied access to the outdoors, or as is the case where I live, um, that wasn't an issue. Uh, mm -hmm. But people began to realize that there was an outdoor and, and, uh, and that they had, um, uh, uh, that in a sense, they were invested in that, you know, so that already kind of created it. But what I rather suspect you might be talking about is that that was the case in year one. Mm -hmm. But by year two, even that had begun to he wrote, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Um, so that was your experience as well. Mm. And in terms Here of your question. students, one final thing then, mm. sorry, just in terms of your students, um, do you have modules or training on how to begin those dialogues? Or do you just, obviously you were looking at, at, at the various criteria, empathy and so on, you know, mm. 
um, sometimes they can be uh, hard to impart mm -hmm. if somebody doesn't have a natural how do you actually prepare that ground of course um, this has been of course also challenged by the pandemic um, because when you have to do everything online you are much more you, know, you rely much more on the existing contacts and so you cannot actually occasionally just talk to everyone or have maybe i mean usually we would actually put some object into a square and then we are there and now we can talk to us and all the all of these funny things they just didn't work in uh, the past years so here we start from scratch again i think now um but of course um we give the um, students of course case studies so so they see how it has been done elsewhere there's of course an entire, an entire toolbox of how to raise awareness how to engage with community members and we uh, of course we do workshops where they see these methods in practice um, they um, they um, apply empathy mapping uh, stakeholder roundtables but it's not just the organized stakeholder Called a round table. It's also being in the community and just talking to people. You know, not not with the intention. Uh, I ask you and you tell me, but I just I'm just here. I want to know what is about here. Just let, just tell me what what is going on going on here. So we need to uh, to learn to be really open and unbiased, and we need to bound before they. Uh, yeah, so that they, they, they learn not, not, not to see people as objects, as scientific objects, but as something um, which, of course, has a human dimension and you have to be respectful and you need to listen and um, build trust and so on. Yeah. yeah thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There was also something in, in the chat, I think. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, there are many questions on the <laughs> chat and uh, Arati already answered but uh, is also interesting if you well and can uh, give your uh, contribution yes yeah, so this question from An angelica about um, i mean it's um, as i said it's like this and like that sometimes when you have a community of interest they come to us and sometimes uh, we might explore that there is maybe also or we sense that there's a landscape conflict then we go actually into an environment and just say let's try to understand what is the community here because maybe sometimes we don't know the com community yet and then through our interventions the community is maybe better identified than it was before and this is already an, an impact yeah, it's, it, we have these two situations i think in general do you have a call can i um, Ellen, do, do you have a call? How do they get to know that the university does this? Do you advertise? And so they, you have uh, people applying to have to ask for your help? Um, yeah, I mean, of course, we doc documented in the local newspaper. And I mean, we are here a small community. It's 45,000 people in this little town here. So of course, we meet people all the time and we talk, talk about it. Um, so this is how it's word of mouth and through the newspaper yep, at the moment. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I think the question from Joanna is also very interesting. A little above. Would you like to answer it? Um, yeah, I, I, what I feel about uh, thinking too big is uh, a danger we face uh, in in everyday uh, scenario, I think um, sometimes we take on a lot more than um, we can chew. And it, it actually, I have experienced during the IPs that it's, it gets so exciting that you want to solve a lot of things and, you know, hit every single issue that you're being um, thrown at. Um, but then what uh, becomes really effective is the process that we follow um, through the Lead to Leap program and these these step-by-step uh, -step modules of approaching it in a way that starts solving it through the issues of um, learning and participation and bringing together a kind of structure into the into the problem-solving mode then becomes um, a bit better to handle. Um, sometimes we uh, come away. Uh, not entirely uh, satisfied with everything that we have achieved. And sometimes we come away with um, with a better feeling from really small interventions, like I was showing before. Mm. Of course, and I think you, you have a better... Yeah, uh, I think um, maybe before. it's also important to, of, of course, I think we can't 
So we can't be fully responsible for the community building. This is something which might happen or might not happen. I think what maybe is the common ground is that that we try to speak on behalf of the landscape. So that's maybe so we try to so we just try to give a voice to the landscape in and and. Uh, this way engage with the com community because my feeling is that often landscape has no voice um, in our environment um, but it but it has of course but with uh, this voice you have actually a stage to which everyone can contribute and then then again this can become a democratic process and it's about cul cultivating this voice giving for the landscape which maybe is the com common crown no? yeah so we are also, I think we are not without norms. Um, so of course I don't go into this environment and say you can do now everything with your landscape, of course I have, but I just want to do it in a different way, not saying um, um, there are these landscape values and I know what they are, but um, I want to discuss with you about this in a creative way, in an inspiring, engaging way to see what can evolve. There's a question there from Joe Boone and as well further up the conversation um, who writes uh, during these interesting workshops with students do you also draw knowledge from other professions or experts I'm thinking for example about political scientists social workers philosophers where do you uh, where do you get knowledge about what democracy mean? well actually okay there are two questions there the second one is where do you get knowledge about what democracy means in landscape mm -hmm. democracy. So the first part of the question is, do you contact other people in the area who may be coming at the same sort of issue with at different angles, like sociologists, social workers, philosophers? Mm -hmm. um, maybe I should mention that uh, what was an interesting evolution with the second round of projects is that we, um, that we involved the NGO partners in two hour applications. So it was already a very, very big step in the, the first one. We were only universities. And of course, we, had, we were also embracing in the theoretical aspects of other, of polit political theory and so on. And in, in the second round, uh, we, we tried to partner each university with an NGO, where you have also people from different disciplines and who, who really have the direct connection to the community. So the N NGOs would actually bring in the community um, environment and the kind of multi or transdisciplinary context. And um, I can really recommend you if you're looking into Erasmus Plus, um, because this is not known um, either by because many people think that Erasmus Plus is only for your universities, but you can actually involve any organization into Erasmus Plus NGOs, um, really sm small initiatives can be part of it. And this is incredibly source of learning because then you, you're really thrown into the real thing because these might be um, NGOs who are really engaging for many years with a certain context and they know everything and they have the, so the social context and so on. That's really deep learning then. The second part of the question, if I might jump in there um, from Joe Boone, and this, where do you get knowledge about what democracy means in landscape democracy? Now, Joe, if you want to uh, switch on your mic and come in and maybe expand on your question before um, you come to it. I'll try to explain my own thinking. Um, so democracy is still also in, in the book, exploring or, or defining landscape democracies. It's not like one thing. It can be. It can mean many different things, and my question would be: in the 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 spaces that you go do your workshops, how do you explore what democracy in that space exactly means? How is it organized? How what is the political structure of that space? Is that part of the process that you go through? Yeah, we call this the community mapping uh, processes. Somehow, this is a, a kind of an yeah an understanding and the community map has maybe the landscape assets it has the community members who is actually there but also where are maybe the landscape conflicts um so you so we try to have a kind of a system and power map um of the of the community um, uh, and of course this is uh, developed of course by talking to people by uh, exploring the environment by reflecting the theories and concepts this is one of the assignments to put this into what we call the com community map and this shows the assets risks the people but also the should be somehow vi visualized in there yeah. and i think one important understanding is that uh, of course we discuss with the students different ideas of what uh, democracy can mean. Of course, many think that democracy is the representative democracy um, when we go to vote and everything, but we also tell them there's something like a 
deliberative democracy, which is um, um, a culture of arguing, of understanding, of um, not overruling. And, um, and if we want to have a real democracy, we need to cultivate this in our di direct environments, in our everyday practice, because then otherwise there's no foundation of what we call a representative di democracy. And this is, I think this is maybe the root of the deep democracy crisis we have also. And maybe landscape and landscape thinking, landscape advocacy can be a key to cultivating again this kind of deep uh, democracy that we need. Thank you for that answer. We have a question from a guest from Vietnam. Uh, Hugh, hello, it's lovely to know that you're there. Um, and you can probably read this yourself, but I'll read it out for the others, okay. So hello from Vietnam, thank you for sharing um, uh, sharing about landscape democracy, democracy landscape. Uh, that seems new and exciting to me. Sorry, I have to scroll down, I have a question. The main idea of the democracy landscape is to make everyone happy. It is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The ideal case is that all the people are of the same opinion, but in practice, I find that this really happens most of, I'm sorry, I'm reading, I have to scroll at the same mm -hmm. time. Uh, most of which arise from differences of desire and conflicts of interest from many parties. What is our solution to this problem? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. So, uh, I mean, we, we try to highlight the, let's say an awareness of the process of co-creation. And in this process of co-creation, you might have also co-creation of what values and which goals and objectives you might have for uh, this environment. And of course, if you have a diversity of people, there might be different goals. And uh, the process should be designed in, designed in such a way that even the um, people who might be unhappy with a certain goal uh, still can bring their idea to the table. And then there's a deliberation, a co-design process in which they eventually maybe synthesize things and become part of a bigger picture. So, I mean, uh, it's important to involve people who have different opinions and who might be critical because it can really strive a better solution. And but that's again uh, the responsibility is in the in the design of uh, the of uh, the process that you really um, create something new by synthesizing the differences that you have. And maybe you need to start again sometimes <laughs> to in, in, in a new round. If people are maybe too, or too unhappy with the results, then you need to go a step back and maybe go on a different pathway. It's not always linear. And I don't think that the idea is to make everyone happy. It's more important to make everyone, uh, let's say, to give an entry point to everyone and a kind of um, an understanding of how they are part and how the knowledge evolves to make it really transparent and to steer that. And then you will be surprised um, maybe how much we can agree actually, because sometimes people just don't agree because they, they are not bound to about the same vision or something. <laughs> I see that Arati has also answered uh, mm -hmm. that question as well. So thank you for doing that. Um, I have a little note here from Tessa to ask whether, sorry, I'm sorry, I thought my phone was switched off. Um, that maybe we might start to wrap up the, um, the questions and answers there. Um, but, You're not sure if Arati, maybe if you want to have a concluding yeah, remark. Yeah, Arati on that last one and maybe mm -hmm. this. Um, well, I already put it in the chat, but uh, it's also about building empathy among different stakeholders who exist in the landscape. So the question is actually very interesting because yeah, the idea would be to satisfy everyone and everyone feels the need that their issues should be satisfied or addressed. And sometimes um, they may not be doable, like Ellen said, or maybe we need a completely different approach after the entire 10 days workshop, we realize that the approach doesn't work anymore and that we probably need to start from scratch. But what would be then very interesting would be to establish um, an empathy uh, or an understanding, so to say, between stakeholders to, to get to know what everybody's concerns are. And, and sometimes one person's concern is actually another person's solution. And that then uh, becomes, becomes important that that comes together on one table where everybody can see it. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the workshop that we conduct, one of the exercises that we help stakeholders to, to sit together head to head and be able to see each other's concerns. Okay. Um, 
that motif is kind of behind the the series as well, where the disciplines meet, because I think we're all very conscious of the fact that, you know, that's speaking to to the academy as such. But landscape is where people meet, and it um, the projects you're involved in are kind of driving home the message of co-creation, uh, co-authorship, and and the sense that there can be multiple landscapes in what is geographically or spatially the same place, and that one person's landscape can be exclusive to somebody else who's just effectively living in the same spatio-temporal uh, environment. We have a question from Andrea Galli, actually, I see here. Um, what problems, in your opinion, doesn't work in more institutional participative experiences like eco-museums or river contracts? Are they too much administrative and formal, essentially? Maybe, Andrea, would you like to, to turn on your mic and elaborate a little bit on your question there? Um, yes. Hi, good evening. Even, probably is not enough clear. My, my question is to make a comparison among the, the approach uh, presented by the relators, the speakers, uh, with other experience uh, um, which are uh, from long time in, in the field, in the territory, like uh, the IC Museum or uh, Ribbon Cortes, where uh, the participation is a key uh, element of uh, this uh, kind of process. Uh, but where uh, administrative, politician, technician, uh, economics uh, problems uh, can um, can uh, um, create a, a false kind of uh, participation process, participative process. Uh, my, my my question is: What what do you do you think about the, this? If uh, my question is much clear mm. now, of course I understand. Of course, there's a lot of attempts to participation out there in our administrations, and uh, but I mean I don't know if you're aware of the. I mean there has been this theory of the ladder of participation, and it goes from information which is usually yeah. in consultation. This is what is often, which is something which you can easily con control, you know. <laughs> but the highest form would be like, something like co-governance or co-ownership. And this is hardly achieved and often also not wanted. This is, I mean, more dimension. So where, where is an authority really willing and confident to give uh, away power uh, in order also to generate resources. I mean, this, this uh, would be the idea if you have people who have really an interest in these landscape goals, who are in the community, who are from business, who are from so social groups. And if you coordinate them as a com community to build their own solution. So are, 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 we really are we really ready to give away power? This is something maybe the key, uh, the key, uh, the key, uh, the key, uh, the key question here because it might also raise conflicts to values that you want that you think you have to protect so um, there's no real solution here i think this is something we need to try and further explore i and that I, I i i just hope that especially in the public ad administration sector that there will be more learning more con confidence in this because uh, the, the problems are actually too complex for them to resolve and um, rather than uh, sitting on it technically I just hope that there will be more con confidence, more explore, explore, exp more exploration of how community-based solutions could actually be part of this approach to reach this, uh, the same goals, rather than sit, uh, sitting on the authority. But also, you sit on all uh, the, the problems. No, that's very often the case, isn't it? Mm. We have a question from Ernesto there. Um, uh, he describes it as a trivial question, but I don't think it is, Ernesto. Um, mm -hmm. It's um, the role of technologies in the process and whether you see uh, that they threaten the democratization of different groups interacting. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to ask Ernesto mm -hmm. to elaborate on that, do, but otherwise. I mean, we, we, we use the online class primarily to link the campuses. So this, is, was, this was primarily always for an academic audience. So for them, I think 
it wasn't an issue. Um, if I, I don't think that technology is a solution for bridging all the gaps we have in communication in our local community. So you need many more methods. Um, so it's, I think it's the diversity. Maybe some young people are maybe fun with participating through their smartphones. Then it might be important to give them this kind of pathways. But um, I think the key is really to be there present and to build a connection before you can actually expect more. So this is always the foundation is, I think, having some sort of bonding to uh, uh, the people. So that's maybe, yeah, so you have to give something from yourself into the pot before you can expect people to participate. And that's maybe the key. And then, of course, there's a lot of tools around by which you can engage people. And I, I, I would always go for diversity and I would go for games because um, I think we are so much now into our boxes <laughs> that we need something new maybe to overcome. Um, I think, and to bond again. You touched on something very interesting there, and that is when you said, you know, maybe the younger generation might be more comfortable dealing with things through their mobile phones, and that's obviously creates its own challenge. And not, I don't mean the technology, but literally the cross generational range, and making sure that your stakeholders are diversified in all directions, including age, mm -hmm. um, in creating landscapes that are capable of providing uh, attraction to all different groups. Uh, mm. How do you tackle that issue? Is there a particular thing you have to think about all the time in that regard? Or, or does it happen spontaneously that you just get mm. this mix of age groups? Or? Mm. I cannot fully answer to that. Maybe uh, Joanna has also an answer here, <laughs> I see. Mm. Um, I, I just see what, what works well for us is actually that, that when we try to start with a community festival, um, which is really on site in, in the neighborhood and which is something that everyone can easily understand what it means. So you uh, really need these kind of cultural events, I think, that bring really people together from very, very different environments and contexts. And, um, and maybe in combination with some more um, things of that kind, uh, that's really needed to get people out, out of the box and to get this first bonding. Um, so just saying we want to we want to change something and we want you to participate, this will always call on the usual suspects. But here it's about something else. It's about the landscape as a whole, not in the first place about some, something we want to change. You know? it's, and it's maybe also hard to communicate. People might uh, respond more to a concrete change idea and then maybe react on it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this is often not how we want to start. We want to start a, a community building process based on the landscape. And it's not easy uh, to communicate. So you need really creative tools um, to get people out of the box and um, somehow attached to the topic. I think that's probably a good place to end. There are lots of comments and some of them are comments, some of them are questions, some of them are a combination of both. And I've been trying to scroll through them and listen uh, to you at the same time. So I'm sorry if we haven't got uh, to everybody, um, but just to revert back to something you mentioned at the very start, which I think is uh, a, a real common principle for all of us. And that is what you described as the third mission. Um, it's, you know, um, it's a revolution in, in, in the role of universities who have always tried, at least in some measure, maybe it's lip service in a lot of cases, but certainly to reach out to communities. But in this very competitive world that we live in, in the academic world where, um, you know, international rankings and all of that sort of uh, nonsense that goes on, it, it, you know, it gets in the way of new modalities of research and of dissemination um, and even of teaching. Um, and I think you've both opened our eyes here, both uh, the speaker, both Ellen and Arati, the respondent to uh, how this can really work. You know, I'd love you to, to come to Galway sometime <laughs> and to knock on a few doors around our campus to show what can really uh, work and happen. But until that, occasion arises um, on my own behalf and on behalf of Uniscape, just to thank you very much for um, a brilliant talk, a great start to the series, uh, very engaging. Uh, we really feel like you invited us into your, mm -hmm. your room and into your head and into your world and Arati as well. Thank you so much um, for that. 
um, and we will announce the next lecture, which occurs in about a month's time uh, shortly. Uh, and I think you'll find uh, it's a natural follow on from um, the opening uh, part, at least if not the whole part uh, of your talk today on sustainability. And you know what you've been describing here is a sustainable way of educating, a sustainable way of researching that actually really does uh, break down whatever barriers may exist uh, between universities and um, and the general public whom we serve, who pay our salaries <laughs> at the end of the day. So thank you very much. And thank you to everybody who's been here. I hope you have a very pleasant onward evening.